when we read the first five books of the Bible, we will find many laws there contained. Uh, some of the laws are pretty straightforward. Uh, thou shalt not kill. Others may be seemingly uh, very remote from us, like certain laws that uh, governed the building of the temple, the decorations of the altars in the temple, etc. Um, so how do we make sense of uh, all these laws in the Old Testament? And uh, we want to ask these ultimate questions. Are the Old Testament laws meant for Christians today? So in the first five books of the Old Testament, known as the Torah in Hebrew, or we translate it as the law, that means as a whole, these five books are known as the law. And it contains 613 laws. The contents of uh, the law, that means within these five books, are wide ranging. They include norms governing uh, temple worship. We know that temple worship was something very important for the ancient Israelites. And uh, about the religious sacrifices that they were supposed to offer and the various kinds of uh, offerings and the stipulations of the uh, items that were to offer. And then there were laws uh, governing familiar obligations, that means within the family, husband and wife, uh, other family members, communal interactions, relationship with uh, people in the community, the clients, the neighbors, and uh, economic activities and productions, uh, how economic activities were supposed to um, get on and how to distribute uh, the productions, etc. Food hygiene, of course, uh, certain food that were allowed to be eaten, others not, and uh, many other aspects of life, all contained in uh, the law. And if you turn the pages of these five books, you find some major sections, major parts of the law. You have in the book of Exodus, a number of chapters on the book of the covenant, including uh, what is known as the Ten Commandments. And then in chapter 34, to chapter 36, um, you have the liturgical decalogue. Leviticus, a number of chapters on the law of holiness, all kind of purity that they should maintain. And uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, you have what is known as the Deuteronomic Code. Some are Reputations of what found in uh, the book of Exodus, some are unique to this book. Now, these five books are attributed to Moses as the originator. That's why often we call uh, the 613 laws contained therein uh, the Mosaic laws. But in fact, these books had very long history of oral and literal traditions. That means it, it took them a long time, first by oral transmissions and then by uh, pieces of uh, written work and eventually the 
final compilation. It took a long time to actually complete the five books. And therein contain at least four different traditions. I shall not enter into details of that. Uh, if you are interested, you can read up uh, on uh, this aspect. And then eventually uh, someone uh, redacted and compiled the books as we see them today, the five books. We observe in the Torah a variety of style of writing and a lack of sequence. That means not very orderly, uh, the, the writing. Uh, it, jumpy, we would say it, uh, from, from topic to topic. And at times, repetitions in narrations. All these would be signs, indicators, uh, which counter the claim that it was one single author who wrote the five books at one specific time. And people say that it was Moses, but that could not be because the whole writing took hundreds of years for the eventual compilation. When we acknowledge the fact that Moses was not the sole author of Pentateuch, then God could not have spoken to him regarding those texts not written by him. Yeah, parts of the text passages might came from Moses, but many others were not from Moses. But in the five books, it was often mentioned that God spoke to Moses and then Moses addressed the people as if God was dictating to Moses and Moses just passed on the messages. That could not be the case. Eh? So the claim that God spoke to Moses should not be taken literally. It was just a way for ancient Israelites to attribute their famous hero, in this case, Moses, as the major figure who had influenced the writing of the Pentateuch. And scholars discovered that some laws were actually enacted during the time of Moses. True, yeah. But some were actually in existence way before him. And others came after him. But all was attributed to Moses. Now, just give you one example. The law, the provision of circumcision, that right was already in place way before Moses. And we read this remark from our Lord Jesus himself. Huh? In one of the dialogue, Jesus said, Moses ordered you to circumcise your sons, although it was not Moses. Huh? So from the mouth of the Lord himself, not Moses, but your ancestors who started it, and so you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. If a boy is circumcised on the Sabbath so that Moses' law is not broken, why are you angry with me because I make a man completely well on the Sabbath? So this remark was uh, made on one occasion when the, uh, some of the scribes and Pharisees complained that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And then Jesus mentioned that, no, but, but you, you people, no, uh, on some occasions, you all do perform circumcision on Sabbath. Then, then are you contradicting yourself? And why are you questioning me? A 
Among the Old Testament laws, uh, of course, we are most familiar with what is known as the Ten Commandments. And by movie uh, and, and, and storybooks, we, we got the impression that uh, Moses went out Mount Sinai and there he got a, a vision of God, uh, an apparition. And in fact, uh, God used his finger to write on the tablet the Ten Commandments. So they are the best known mosaic laws. And uh, Catholics at times take them as guiding norms for practical morality. Uh, if you read some of the pre-Vatican II catechism books, uh, often when it comes to Christian morality, uh, Ten Commandments uh, uh, would be listed. Now, but actually the way uh, our catechism book uh, lists the Ten Commandments is slightly different from uh, the listing in two passages of the Old Testament found in Exodus 20, 1 to 17, and then Deuteronomy chapter 5, 1 to 21. So both uh, these passages contain the Ten Commandments. Now, the one that we find in these two passages actually have four commandments in relation to God, and then six commandments in relation to man. Uh, but in our catechism books, uh, they are kind of a slightly uh, reworded and then to make it into three commandments related to God and seven commandments related to uh, men, respectively. Uh, the, the content more or less the same, but uh, the numbering differ. And then, of course, the interpretations is uh, made in such a way to to fit uh, uh, modern context. These ten commandments, uh, each one is either a prohibition, that means uh, you shall not, or a directive, you shall. So we have uh, the first commandment, you shall have no gods except me. So this is uh, a prohibition, but put in in, a, in a such a way eh, that you shall have not. Now, implicit in this uh, statement was the ancient Jewish understanding that uh, different groups of people, different tribes, different nations, they each worship their own God. And Israelites at times were tempted to follow other tribes, other nations to worship their God. So the impression uh, when we read today is that, yeah, there are many groups competing with one another, each uh, proclaiming that they have the one true God. And of course, the Israelites will say that, no, 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 you shall not have any other gods, but only the God of Israel. And then the second commandment, you shall not make yourself a calf image. Uh, sometimes we translate as either or any likeness of anything, blah, blah, blah. The Catechism book combine these two into one commandment. Uh, you should have only one God and you should only worship Him. Now the tenth commandment in the two Old Testament passages is one concerning you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not set your heart on his house and other properties.
Now, I will mention later on, uh, uh, you realize that um, for the catechism, uh, uh, they combine first and second one, and they break up the tenth commandment into two. Uh, so you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, number nine, and then you shall not cover your neighbor's good, number ten. Uh, this change actually uh, is very significant. I will explain later. What I would like to impress upon you today is that the Old Testament laws all was man-made, not God commanded. It was said that God commanded Moses, God even personally wrote the Ten Commandments. That could not be the case. They were all man-made laws, but attributed to God. I explained uh, in the previous talk that uh, being a theocentric people, ancient Israelites, they would attribute all activities to God. So they went to war. They said God commanded them to go to war. They married a second wife. They said God asked them to marry the second wife. And their leaders promulgated the laws. They said God spoke to their leaders and the laws came from God. That was the Old Testament mentality. But how, how dare we say that they were not commanded by God? There are three major reasons. Number one, Jesus himself said so. Number two, we look at these laws and we realize that they had their historical, social, cultural context. And then we examine the contents of some of these laws and realize that they are really very ungodly, unchrist-like. And if you compare to the teaching of Jesus, then this law were contradictory to the teaching of Jesus. And Jesus is the Son of God. So God cannot contradict himself. He, I mean, the God the Father and God the Son. So those laws in ancient times were not commanded by God, but promulgated by their leaders, but attributed to God as if God commanded those laws. Now we look at uh, the remark of Jesus about Old Testament laws. On one occasion, uh, when uh, the Jews commented about the disciples of Jesus not washing their hands and not washing the pots and pans before eating, Jesus entered into a discussion with them and he made certain remarks, including uh, telling the Jews that uh, they claim to obey the commandment to honor their father and mother, but actually they, they did not. And Jesus mentioned that Moses said, do your duty to your father and your mother. Moses said, Jesus didn't say, my father, God said, no, Moses said. Jesus clearly considered the Old Testament laws as Mosaic laws, laws attributed to Moses. And the people during the time of Jesus, his contemporary, also regarded them as mosaic law. I think on coming Wednesday, uh, our gospel reading will touch on uh, this issue about marriage. Uh, but I think the coming uh, reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, so this one is the parallel of the Gospel of Mark from Matthew 22. When the Sadducees questioned Jesus about uh, the marriage arrangement that uh, when someone died without 
having a child, then his brother is supposed to take over the responsibility, marry this woman. And then in this hypothetical question, seven men married the same woman and the Sadducees asked Jesus what happened at the time of resurrection. And they, these people, in their questioning, they say, Master, Moses said that if a man dies, childish. So even this group of peoples, when they refer to the Old Testament laws, they say, Moses said. Now we look at the different contexts of the Old Testament laws. And we realize that their enactment has historical, cultural, and political backgrounds. And some of these laws were very similar to those of other neighboring nations, such as the Assyrian laws, the Hittite code, and the code of uh, Hammurabi. Uh, in ancient times, most likely these different countries, they influence one another in the formulations of their codes. And Israelites would have referred to and borrowed some of these uh, laws from other cultures. One context, religious protectionism. We know that uh, when uh, ancient Israelite tried to conquer the land and establish themselves as a people, a group, a nation, eventually, they were very strict about their own religious purity. And religion is something very important for them to keep to their own ethnic identity. And therefore, they have very strict religious law prohibiting apostasy. That if you abandon the Jewish religion and if you worship another god of another religion, that was very serious offense. And therefore, in their yeah, laws, in this case, uh, the so-called second commandment of the Decalogue, you have this uh, instruction, you shall not bound down to the calf images or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, and I punish the father's fault in the sons, the grandsons, and the great-grandsons of those who hate me. So the punishment is supposed to continue for four generations. And we could understand uh, when a small group, Israel was not a big nation, who was trying to preserve their own identity, they, they need to have such protectionist attitude, very strict prohibition of their people to apostatize. And therefore, in their law, they had this uh, very punitive uh, mention, even to the fourth generations of the offender. Understandable in their context, but obviously for us, is that is uh, too harsh. And from our teaching about who God is by Jesus, we know that God would not have done that. But in the first place, there are not many gods. It's not true that there are different groups worshipping different gods. If people really are worshipping God, then they are only worshipping the same God because there can only be one God. It is not true that there are many gods and each group worship their own God and they compete and try to prove whose God is the greatest. That is not true. It's not true that there are many gods. There is only one God. Just that people understand and worship this same God 
differently. And some of them, of course, have very distorted understanding of God and they have certain rituals and all that that they thought that would be pleasing to God and all that. Aaron is wrong for them to do that. But ultimately, it is people attempting to, to seek and find and worship the one same God. Context to social stratifications. Uh, the, the word stratification means that uh, in society you, you, you divide people into classes, into castes, and, and some group of people will be more dominant. They have greater say, they have greater authority, and so forth. And we know that ancient societies uh, accept the system of slavery, and it was a common practice not only for the Jews, but for the Egyptians, for many other countries in the world. And then they also accepted polygamy in a patriarchal social context. Uh, of course, there was a exception in some places in the world where women had uh, seems to have uh, equal right or greater right. But most cases in ancient societies, uh, it was men who had had the upper hand. Anyway, uh, in, 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 in the case of uh, master and slave uh, arrangement, today it's really unthinkable for us to, to advocate slavery or to brag about having more than one wife. Uh, but understandably, in those ancient contexts, uh, they accepted that as uh, okay. So context three, uh, where in ancient uh, Israelite society, because of their patriarchism, um, you have in the 10th commandment, uh, this one single statement that you shall not covet your neighbor's half, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's servant, ox and donkey. They mean a uh, house, wife, servant, donkey. They were all grouped together as the man's property. And even the children uh, would be considered the man's property. Today, this understanding would definitely be rejected by all of us. Uh, how can you consider uh, your your wife as your property uh, and you have you can do with her do with him your children any way you want but that was the mentality of ancient time our catechism book uh, separated the two into thou shalt not cover your neighbor's wife then thou shalt not cover your neighbor's good and then in our Today's interpretation, we say that thou shalt not cover your neighbor's wife. We, we give a, a modern interpretation that you should be faithful to your wife, etc., etc. But in the original context, that was not the meaning. It simply means that you cannot take other people's wife because she is part of his property. And this uh, understanding was their understanding, but obviously we will reject it. Context for military warfare. Ancient warfare adopted the principle of annihilation. When uh, you conquer your enemies, you must wipe up the population entirely, or at least the male population, and then you, you took the women as slaves, etc. And that was to avoid your enemy taking revenge in years to come. Uh, in Chinese, they call zan chao chu gen, uh, you, you pull up the roots when you whip, whip up. Uh. And so we read in a number of passages that uh, th the Israelites, they were commanded to slaughter the Canaanites, uh, the Hittites, the Amalekites and so forth. And when they did not do that, it was said that God 
got angry with them. Uh, we mentioned it in the second talk on the angry God. And obviously, it was not true that God was the one who commanded them to go for war and that God commanded them to wipe out their enemies. It was the standard practice of military warfare of the time. And then there are some ungodly contents that are found in the Old Testament and uh, clearly contradicted the teaching of Jesus, the Son of God, make man. I give you this famous example uh, that in the Old Testament, the law says that uh, the adulterers must be put to death. That's why during the time of Jesus, uh, a woman was caught in adultery and then uh, the hypocritical Pharisees brought her to Jesus and said that, Master, what do you say this woman was caught in adultery? According to the law of Moses, uh, we are supposed to stone her to death. That was when Jesus used his finger to write on the ground. And then they pressed on him and eventually he said, let anyone who has not seen be the first to cast a stone. And then they left one by one. So here, very clearly that Jesus rejected that punitive law of Deuteronomy 22. And he showed great compassion on this woman. Then he told her, woman, no one condemn you, go and sin no more. Now, the gestures of Jesus writing on the ground was very symbolic. Because in the Old Testament, uh, it was claimed that uh, God used his, finger, used his fingers to write on the tablet the Ten Commandments. So God was the authority behind the Old Testament laws. Here Jesus, by writing on the ground using his finger, is asserting his authority as the Son of God, that he is the one who has authority to make the moral judgments. And then Jesus did not keep the traditions of the elders deriving from the Old Testament laws. And so in Mark 7, Jesus remarked that nothing that goes into a person from outside can make someone unclean because it's not got into his heart, but into the stomach, and then goes up of his body. So in saying this, Jesus declared that all foods are fit to be eaten. The last statement was a remark by uh, the evangelist Mark, but uh, the whole discussion here was Jesus clearly indicated that the the quotes, the law concerning purity and cleansing and so forth, uh, uh, they, they were not applicable for him and for people of his time and of course subsequently for us. Uh, that these uh, laws about cleansing and purity uh, had the historical context in ancient time, but not for us. And Jesus did not keep to the letters of the laws. And we know that one of the most important laws of the Jews was the, the law to keep the Sabbath. By the way, uh, Sabbath uh, is Saturday for the Jews. Today, sometimes we, we, we misquote. Uh, we say that we must keep Sunday holy. But Sunday is not a Sabbath. Sunday is not Saturday today. Sunday for us is the first day of the week and is meant to commemorate the resurrection of the Lord. So we do not keep the Sabbath actually, we keep the Lord's day, which is the, the day of resurrection. Anyway, the Lord healed a man on the Sabbath day and he was uh, criticized by the scribes and the Pharisees because they wanted to keep to the minute details of the law and they have forgotten that the spirit of the law was meant to uh, serve the welfare of the persons. The Sabbath was meant to be a day of worship, but literally it was meant also to be the day of rest so that people can have good health. They would not overwork. Yet they fought 
Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus was, of course, very upset with them and uh, reminded them that, yeah, if you find a son or an ox that uh, fell into the well on the Sabbath, would you not pull him out? You, you would have done that. Uh, then, of course, it is perfectly okay for me to heal on the Sabbath. Not that Jesus deliberately chose Sabbath to, to, to perform healing, just that happened that on the Sabbath, he met this man in need and he healed him. It could be another day if Jesus would have met him. Uh, but the point is that uh, Jesus told them that they should not be too preoccupied with the letters of the laws. In Matthew 5, Jesus mentioned that do not imagine that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to complete them. And he said that if your virtue goes no deeper than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus has come to complete the law. And the new spirit the new commandments that Jesus gave to them was highlighted in Matthew 22. Jesus said to them, You must love the Lord your God before your heart, before your soul, before your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second resembles it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets too. Now note that Jesus actually did not give commandments in the sense of you shall do this, you shall not do this. But Jesus actually gave the general principles, the attitude, the spirit that we should have in our relationship with God and with one another. And it is basically one of love. And during the Last Supper, Jesus uh, clarifies even further with regard to loving your neighbors, he said, I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. And must love, and you must love. And, and if you love one another, others will know that you are my disciples. Here Jesus added the elements of as I have loved you uh, to remind them that, yeah, very often, uh, even the way we love others are actually quite self-preoccupied. And if you really want to learn how to love, then we must learn from him how to be able to go up of yourself uh, to care for others and not be self-preoccupied. Now we may have a difficulties here in uh, verse 18 of chapter 5 when Jesus said, Heaven and earth disappear, but not one dot, not one little stroke shall disappear from the law until its purpose is achieved. So in this verse, is Jesus asking us to keep to the minute details of every single of the 613 laws in the Old Testament? From what we described earlier, obviously not, because Jesus himself contradicted many, or at least some of those laws mentioned about the food hygiene law as examples. So, so it would not be that Jesus meant it to be that we observe every details of the Old Testament law. So the answer is found in the last statement there, until its purpose is achieved. And indeed, with the coming of Christ, the Old Testament laws has achieved its purpose and it is now time to move on, to adopt the new mentality, the new uh, spirit of Jesus. And in verse 19, Jesus said that if anyone broke one of the least of these commandments and taught others to do so, that person would be called least in the kingdom. How do these words fit into our discussion? We must note that here, the commandments are not referred to the Old Testament commandments. So Jesus are not asking us to keep to the minute details of the Old Testament. No. 
Here, the commandment is referring to the new commandment of his messianic kingdom. Love God, love your neighbor, love your neighbors as I have loved you. So we must live up to that spirit of Jesus mentioned in the commandments of Jesus, not the Old Testament commandments. In Mark 2, Jesus said that no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. If he does, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and the, and the tear gets worse. And nobody puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins too. No new wine flesh skins. So here the, the old and the new actually is a parable about the Old Testament and the New Testament. That now we have entered into the new era of Christ. We cannot be stuck to the Old Testament mentality. We cannot be stuck to the Old Testament laws. Now with the coming of Christ, then we must adopt a new spirit in our moral practices. In verse 20, Jesus states, Your virtue must go deeper than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees, they were preoccupied with the laws. But Jesus said, we must go deeper, we must go beyond. And following that statement, Jesus gave six concrete examples of how to uh, go beyond the scribes and the Pharisees. And each of these six sessions is introduced by the phrase, You have heard that it was said, and then he quote a saying of the Old Testament, but I say to you, uh, this is another time, we don't have the time to go into details, analysis of uh, these six sets of saying, but basically Jesus is introducing his value, his gospel spirit, and telling them that, yeah, you have the Old Testament laws, and the Old Testament laws by themselves, they are good, but we must go beyond that. We cannot be too literal about the Old Testament laws. We must know what is behind it, what is the spirit, what is the purpose. And it is that value that we need to uphold. Jesus mentioned how the Jews taught and applied certain Old Testament laws. Then he gave his teaching on how his disciples should transcend their legalistic applications. He introduced a new gospel mentality. And in this new spirit, the moral life of his disciples is to be examined. First, I just mentioned that uh, in, in the past it was said, you shall not kill. But Jesus said, I say to you, you should not even say harsh words, angry words to your enemies. What Jesus was trying to tell them was that you must examine your heart because your heart, if you are full of anger, you have grudges, you have resentment, then you will act, you will either kill your enemies or you will do harsh things towards him or you will slander him and so forth if you do not take care of your heart. So it is the heart that you must take care, not so much about the law, In the New Testament era, at the beginning of his proclamation, when he began his public ministry, Jesus said, the time has come and the kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So here we have the twofold emphasis of Jesus. First, we must realize that Jesus is here to establish the kingdom of God. And then how we can realize the kingdom of God meaning the experience of the presence of God and everything that is of God, His mercy, His compassion, His goodness, His justice, His peace, His kindness, and so forth. How do we realize that? It is first by getting rid of what is sinful in our life, repent, and to believe the gospel, to adopt the Beatitudes, the Spirit of Jesus. 
the kingdom of God is close at hand. The emphasis is not about pleasing God and gaining reward, but avoiding offending Him or to prevent punishment as in the case of the Old Testament emphasis that you keep the law, you'll be rewarded. You break the law, you'll be punished. But here the emphasis is about realizing God's kingdom, enabling people to experience the life of God. And so you need the conversion of heart. You need to get rid what is evil in your hearts. You must transform the interior man. You must purify your heart so that your heart is attuned to God. And then believe the gospel, meaning to believe in Jesus, to follow his way of life, to really live up all his gospel teachings. And, and what is the gospel teaching of Jesus? Of course, then we have to read the four gospels. Jesus mentioned so many things. Eh? For example, the Sermon of the Mouse, the Beatitudes, etc., etc., etc. So we, we have to understand the spirit of Jesus and live out his gospel. So let us summarize uh, today's talk. First, we must understand that uh, being theocentric ancient Israelites, they attributed every event to the Lord, including the promulgation of laws. So it was their leaders who uh, established the laws, and some of the laws were borrowed from ancient times or from the middle, neighboring countries and so forth. But they all say that God told Moses that these are the laws. And Old Testament laws were established over a long period of time to address different religious and social needs. I, I give you four examples, uh, four contexts why they had uh, certain laws. For example, uh, for, the, for preserving the, 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 their own religion, purity of the religion, to have social stratifications, one way for them to order their society, and uh, etc. Uh, so they have specific social needs at the time. And then, of course, the food is most likely linked to hygiene. And these laws, including the Decalogues, should not be applied beyond the Old Testament era, outside of their social and cultural context. We mentioned especially Decalogue, uh, the Ten Commandments, because uh, these are very often uh, studied by us. But uh, as I explained to you, that the original Ten Commandments is very different or slightly different from today's, uh, the way we uh, presented in our catechism books. And uh, some of the mentality of ancient people were contained in this Decalogue, like uh, they would treat women as property and their Sabbath day is on Saturday, not Sunday. And that the first commandment about punishing uh, the second commandments uh, combined to first commandment for the Catechism book, punishing uh, the offender to the fourth generations. These were all Old Testament mentality. So if we want to ask this question today, are Old Testament laws meant for Christians? The answer is no. The gospel clearly stated that Old Testament laws are merely mosaic laws, not divine laws. And they are meant for ancient Israelites with their specific context, such as food hygiene, and that's why certain food can eat, certain food cannot eat, in their desert uh, experience and all that. Is, that. There was historical context why they ended up uh, prohibiting certain food. And then religious protectionism, being a small group, they want to keep their people united with one religion. So they were very conscious that there should not be no apostasy. And therefore, if you apostatize, the punishment will be very severe. And then military warfare principle, uh, to eliminate your animals, as practiced by many ancient people. And uh, the need for social stratifications in other society that happens so, so people are divided into classes and so forth and some laws we know that are against the moral principle of christ for example death death penalty by stoning 
and the legalistic observance of Sabbath and uh, equating hygiene laws with morality. Eh? If you do certain things, if you don't wash your hands, don't wash your pot, you are rendered unclean. Eh? And uh, if you touch uh, the, the, the corpse of the dead body, you are unclean, etc., etc. These were not in accordance with uh, Christ's moral principles. In conclusion, Old Testament laws were meant for Israelites with their historical, social, cultural context. They are not meant for Christians today. Of course, some of the laws are still relevant uh, because these are universal values that you shall not kill, you should honour your parents. Uh, but Christians do not depend on these 613 laws in the Old Testament for their moral compass. Our moral guidance is provided by Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. We practice our faith in morality by adopting the gospel, moral principles, and values of Jesus as revealed in the four gospels. If we are able to live out the gospel values, we, we don't need the Old Testament laws at all. Now, saying that, it is presuming that we are all following Christ. We are all passionate about living our life according to the gospel values of Jesus. We want to be like him and so forth and therefore we adopt his mentality, his values, his outlook, his way of life. And when we do that, we would be able to transcend the law. But of course we also recognize that uh, we are weak and many of us uh, do not really live up to the gospel standard of Jesus. And very often we do need laws to kind of uh, warn us, uh, you shouldn't do this, you should, you should do this. Because if there's no one shouting at us like that, you should do this, you don't do this, we, we are likely to stray from the gospel way of Jesus. But saying that doesn't mean that uh, we... We want to take the Old Testament laws as our moral compass because we already have Jesus and his gospel value to lead and guide us in our